with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Wednesday, September 27th, 2023. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Jared Facundo, writing fellow at the American Prospect on rural letter carriers fight for a new union. Then Dr. Sarah Nur Yildiz, professor of history at the Middle East Techno uh, Technical University in Ankara, Turkey, on what just happened in Nagorno-Karabakh. Also on the program today, in the wake of Biden's historic visit to the UAW picket line, Trump visits workers in Michigan to push anti-unionism. Speaking of Donald Trump, Trump Inc. found to have committed fraud in New York State in what amounts to almost like a summary judgment. Right. Prima facie! Still more charges extant. In Las Vegas, hospitality workers vote to authorize a strike. That means I may not be um, eating or drinking while I'm there a couple of weeks. Meanwhile, the WGA East and West vote to end the strike. A ratification vote by the greater membership will start on Monday. Federal Trade Commission and 17 states sue Amazon for massive antitrust violations. And the Democratic, now Democratic controlled FCC, begins the process to bring back net neutrality. Senate reaches a continuing resolution deal, but House unlikely to go for it. And tonight's the night, ladies and gentlemen. Republican debate at 9 p.m. Eastern from Ronald Reagan's crypt. Sadly, again, the debate will be missing one of its most dynamic uh, candidates. Asa Hutchinson will not be there tonight. Federal judge finds Texas's drag ban unconstitutional. And California has just doubled taxes on guns and ammo and banned firearms in public places. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. A lot to get to today. Going to be a long uh, day for us here in the Majority Port uh, Studios. It is, in fact, hump day. Emma will be here tonight for uh the debate hump day actually will be bleeding into hump night um matt and bradley uh planning their um uh, plans for a work stoppage uh having a, a pulled triple shifts today um but we will be covering the debate live tonight starting probably around 8 45. um you don't want to miss this. The charisma of Ron DeSantis, the stylings of Vivek. Sounds like cake. Well, there's more fraud stuff coming out, apparently. Oh, there's more fraud around him? That's weird. That's weird. Uh, Chris Christie, America's most lovable governor. Um, Nikki Haley. Who else do we have? Uh, oh, and uh, Bergam. Bergamentum. And do we have anybody else? I think that's it, right? Six? 
Did I just say six? Seven. No, Asa Hutchinson gone. Well, I think that's it. I think it's just six. But um, nevertheless, this is um, it's the JV team. You said Pence. Oh, Mike Pence. How yeah. could I have forgotten? <laughs> Mike Pence? I thought he was dead. <laughs> there, there he is. Um, uh, so tune in. It should be fun. And um, I'm going to... Uh, I've got a lot of uh, alcohol here. Got a real big supply, actually. Yep, we're going to be uh, locked in. Uh, so uh, we'll get to that. Meanwhile, um, really stunning... Yesterday, when we were talking about the UAD, uh, UAW strike and uh, Joe Biden's visit to the picket line, we outlined just how much um, the press, like in a bizarre fashion, seems to be so hell-bent on making it seem like Donald Trump is heading to support striking workers when he's going to a non-union auto parts supply company which has been set up and promoted by a right-wing organization that promotes anti-unionism and right-to-work uh, legislation all of which has been confirmed at this point and it's not like you know it's just us saying this i saw you know uh, chris hayes was uh interviewing um uh, greenhouse uh the labor former labor reporter for the new york times they walked through all of this and still you see AP and CNN writers claiming that Trump is going to support striking workers. It's bizarre. Uh, this was a one-on-one -on -one with um, uh, Sean Fain on CNN last night uh, with Wolf Blitzer. They're uh, showing a Donald Trump put up the, uh, the uh, thing here, uh, a Donald Trump uh, truth post or whatever it is. Uh, Joe Biden's draconian, indefensible electric vehicle ma mandate will annihilate the U.S. auto industry and cost countless thousands of auto workers to lose their jobs. Let's be clear, and I think Sean Fain uh, says it in this clip. The United Auto Workers are basically agnostic on the EV thing as long as they are protected. What we've watched the, uh, the auto industry attempt to do is like what we've seen with uh, places like Verizon where they set up wireless as non-union and they try and keep their union jobs just with wired tele uh, telephony. And of course, we all know the future is in wireless. And the point is, we need strong unions and government mandates with this money that is coming in to support uh, EV transitions to ensure that these remain union jobs. Here's uh, Sean Fain. Is the former president right? Does the push for electric vehicles here in the United States hurt your union? It doesn't if it's a just transition, and that's what we're fighting for right now. It doesn't if the companies do the right thing and uh, put this work under you know our agreements or to our standards and again it's the companies driving this race to the bottom and they're using our tax dollars to finance it and you know i find a pathetic irony that the former president is going to hold a rally for union members at a non-union business and you know all you have to do is look at his track record his track record speaks for itself in 2008 during the great recession he blamed uaw members he blamed our contracts for everything that was wrong with these companies. That's 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 a complete lie. In 2015, when he was running for president, he talked about doing a rotation, taking all these good-paying jobs in the Midwest and moving them somewhere in the South where people work for less money, and then to make people beg for their jobs back at lower wages. And and the ultimate show of his how much he cares about our workers was in 2019 when he was the president of the United States. Where was he then? GM was, our, our workers at GM were on strike for 60 days, for two months, they were out there on the picket lines. I didn't see him hold a rally. I didn't see him um, stand up at the picket line, and I sure as hell didn't hear him comment about it. So here's he the was question. missing in action. Here's the question to President. Uh, uh, what about the meeting with Trump? Would you meet with him when he's in Detroit tomorrow? 
I see no point in meeting with him because I don't think the man has any has any bit of care about what our workers stand for, what the working class stands for. He serves a billionaire class, and that's what's wrong with this country. Well, that, I mean, there you go. Good for Sean Fain. Hope he's available. I would love him to run in the Democratic yeah, <laughs> frankly. Really um, from the but there it is. I mean, there. I think you 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 can't have anything more explicit. Now, this is on CNN 12, 18 hours ago. Anybody in the AP or CNN, for that matter, writing anything different? The idea that Donald Trump is somehow supporting the striking workers, he's no more supporting the striking workers than, you know, like, uh, coincidentally, uh, I went to the bathroom today. These are non sequiturs. They're complete non sequiturs. I mean, arguably, it's the absolute opposite. You got striking workers at a striking at a picket line across town, and you go to a place that's non union with auto workers. Contradicting the uh, demands of the leadership. I mean, if I'm an auto executive, I'm loving what Trump and all these uh, folks who say, like, it's the, it's the government EV thing um, that's the problem here because it puts the uh, emphasis away from my compensation. Absolutely. And let's be clear, um, you know, I'd like to see if there's any uh, way that the executive can put some restrictions on these uh, subsidies that we're paying. That's what he's talking about, subsidized by tax dollars. Yeah. Needs to go to unions. I mean, that is the, that is the key point here is the EV transition. That needs to be unionized. Um, uh, and on day one. It can't be used as a way to get out from under uh, union contracts. On day one. Um, in a moment, we're going to be talking to Jared Facundo. He's a writing fellow at the American Prospect. He's been writing about this attempt by rural letter carriers to decertify their union contingent upon finding another union uh, because of what's been going on at the post office. And then we'll be talking to Dr. Sarah Nur Yildiz, professor in history at the Middle East Technical University of Ankara, Turkey, uh, about the I I incredible fall of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh um, uh, in the past, I guess, a week and a half. Uh, we'll, we'll be talking to her about that. Um, first, a couple of words from our sponsor today, uh, who not only is sponsoring the show, uh, but also, well, sort of sponsoring my, uh, my dinner a couple times a week, uh, particularly when I have, uh, Saul on board. Um, hello fresh. I've used other services that bring ingredients to your house. Uh, HelloFresh nails it, not just with like delicious food, but also with recipes that are on the low end of effort. I don't want to make it seem like I'm not expending a lot of effort uh, because I'm making good meals, but I just want to do it quicker. I can't spend 45 minutes. Now they have recipes that take uh, 40 minutes, 40, they probably have some that are 45. I don't know, but uh, most of the they're like 35, 40 minutes but they also have some that are 20 and some that are 15. And HelloFresh has um, constantly are updating their menus. You have a, a pick from 40 weekly recipes that are uh, sort of like in uh, different uh, categories of lifestyle. You can have like all veggie or family friendly or like, you know, fit and wholesome type of thing. Um, but uh, the, the beauty is you can pick like how long you want this to take and what kind of food. And um, it, it is super easy. If you go to HelloFresh.com slash 50majority, 50majority, and use the code 50majority, you will get 50% off plus 15% off the next two months. This is the time to try this. Back to school time. I don't know. The end of uh, summer. Um, HelloFresh will deal with all of your meal planning. You look at the menu. You choose. You figure out how many days a week you want it. 
shows up. It is, uh, they're in discreet, sort of like um, uh, meal packages, which is also surprisingly uh, very helpful. Um, and not only that, they also have uh, uh, like 100 add-on items that you can choose from every week. You can get your kid's lunch delivered. So, um, for instance, like I have made like an edamame and chickpea salad, obviously it takes not that much time, but it's, it's delicious and it's filling and I'll get like a pre-made lasagna. They have some of those as well. That takes like literally like, I don't know, seven minutes to heat up and I'm eyeing, even though it's going to be a 30 minute commitment. I can't get this out of my head. It's like a lemon spaghetti with Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts are my favorite vegetable. So, uh, and it's got like panko on it. Anyways, um, HelloFresh is more than uh, just dinners. Like I say, you can stock up your fridge with easy breakfast, quick lunches, fresh snacks. You can shop the HelloFresh market, add any of these tasty time-saving solutions to your weekly box. This is what makes it super, super easy. You're going to save money uh, on your uh, grocery bill. You're going to save a lot of money if you order in a lot. You're going to be able to make fresh cooked meals. And they really, their portions are perfect. Perfectly measured. When you get HelloFresh, you know you're getting top-notch produce. It travels from the farm to your door in less than seven days. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 50 majority. That's 5-0 majority. Use the code 5 0 majority, 50 majority for 50% off plus 15% off the next two months. Check it out. Uh, all right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Jared Facundo, writing fellow at the American Prospect. We are back, Sam Cedar, on the Majority Report. Emma Vigland off today. She'll be back tonight uh, for our coverage of the Republican uh, debate, primary debate. Joining us now, Jared Facundo. He is a writing fellow at the American Prospect. And Jared, I got to say, it is rare that I'm uh, interviewing people about trying to decertify their union. Um, but this is a really fascinating story. I didn't know that there were multiple uh, letter carrier unions. Um, and uh, I don't know if I was really quite aware of like how not terribly effective they are. Um, but just break it down for us. How uh, 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 break down the different uh, uh, letter carrier unions just so we get a sense of, of like the overview of, of wh what exists right now. Yeah, gotcha. So I... I believe there's three different main uh, letter carrier unions. There's the National Association for Letter Carriers, which is typically operates in urban areas. And then there is the APWU. I'm not exactly sure what that acronym is, but it's another um, similar to like urban, suburban sort of stuff. And then there's the National Rural Letter Carriers Association, which is the union that I was writing about. These are... Uh, post office workers who deliver in uh, largely like rural communities which happens to be like the majority of the country right uh it's a big country and um there in may of this year the postal service under uh louis DeJoy and god help me i don't understand why that guy is still there um that's a that's a different question but um the Postal Service adopted a new payment system. Tell us about that. Yes, the new payment system, The it's called REX, but it's like the Rural Route Evaluation Compensa Compensation System. And effectively, it was a, effectively what, what the what Rex does, it's streamline. It's like trimming labor costs, just because it that is like one of the most expensive components to running the post office. 
And under uh, Postmaster General Lewis DeJoy, what he's doing is like really trying to buckle down the cost as much as possible. And like, there's like, the, yes, that's a completely different issue. But what's important is that Rex has been in development for about like almost a decade or a little more than a decade at this point. So the side, the, the union and the post office have been going back and forth on how this is actually going to be implemented. And after um, several de delays into what would actually, into what the system would become, it finally goes into effect in May. And what we end up seeing are rural letter carriers who see their, who are told that they're going to have to make some sacrifices. You're gonna lose a couple hours to your route each week, but once they actually have to, once their routes are actually adjusted, the cuts are way more than they were told by the union. And that's kind of like the source of this frustration. Okay. And, um, uh, and I should just say that I'm being told that the uh, APWU uh, uh, stands for the American Postal Workers Union, and they don't cover la letter carriers. So we really have oh, like okay. only the two, the yeah, urban yeah, and the yeah, rural. Okay. And, um, uh, but with that said, um, how, like, in practice, so uh, the, the rural letter carriers are told by their union, this new uh, system is going to, is basically assessing um, how much of your route can be basically eliminated or that you can do this more efficiently. Which one of those is that, or is there some combination of both? It's a combination of the two. Like it's, the, it's consolidating routes it's consolidating the number of stops onto um, less less delivery or less carriers. So it, it it's it's similar to how uh, like a manufacturing company is going to restructure the way uh, it's the way the like the way shifts are assembled. So it's no longer like a Monday through Friday eight nine to five sort of arrangement. Now you have people going Sunday through Thursday, Wednesday to Saturday. You kind of just have these like over lapping uh, operations in order to simultaneously do more but with less. And in the case of the post office, um, there's no, we don't get mail on Sunday. So they're working within a six day framework. I had one letter carrier tell me about how before Rex was implemented, he was working 42 hours, six days a week. And on that, everything he did on that six day was compensated at overtime and after Rex, he actually gains an hour, which kind of goes against some of what's been going on or some of the complaints. But these that hour they gained, it's on the it, it's an, it's in a five day time frame. So he's like completely cut out of the earth. He's completely cut out of the opportunity of being able to earn overtime. I see. And so what was like, I mean, what was the impact of this for the majority of people in terms of like, were they just losing hours or were they um, just simply also getting paid less? For the amount of hours that they were working the majority of them did lose hours like that ranges between like four to seven hours while the rural letter carriers union told them that the majority of people would only lose about an hour so you're talking about you're quadrupling the amount of time on your job you're losing and i mean if it's four to seven hours you're looking at anywhere from 10 to almost 20 percent of your work right i mean uh, i mean i'm presuming like you know just of a, a, a 40-hour work week even yeah yeah exactly i mean in the story I, I talked to one rural carrier in florida and granted he like lost 12 hours and we're not exactly sure how the data spits it back out where that's the result but in his case he's losing fifteen thousand dollars a year so i mean if we see that as like the top end of how a rural carrier can be impacted now let's let's kind of take let's like let's take a couple like let's go a couple hours less but still the impact is huge i mean and we're also talking about this in the backdrop of inflation that's like settling but you also it, it it's been a rough couple years and just to get slapped with you have to take these concessions and i would imagine that uh uh the amount of work that has to be done has increased within the context of that of those hours that exist right like they're they're demanding a higher level of productivity if you will out of uh the letter carriers correct correct and i was not tipped off about this until after the piece came out but 
um, some some of the carriers they have like questions about how or every single part of their job it's it's another data point that's going to be spit back into Rex to give them a new evaluation a couple months down the road. One example I was given was like if you're going to um, imagine like like an apartment complex of sorts where there's like several several uh, stops you have to technically um, deliver to like how is that going to be evaluated in the way the route's designed and because there's no because the rural the lottery carriers don't really have um, a peek into how the stat is being used or like what the inputs are from the start they don't under it's unclear to them how um, the realities of the job are reflected in the route the new routes therefore compensation that they receive how much was the union brought into the development of this system? So I know the union was involved with it for uh, for the majority of for the majority of the time that it was like negotiated, like about a decade ago. I mean, I wasn't covering it back then, but I mean, my boss David Dayan has kind of kept up with it, and it's it's been it it didn't happen overnight. In other words, fair enough. And and so okay, and so. Um, these, uh, rural letter carriers, they, uh, essentially are told by their union, you're going to lose maybe an hour of pay and they end up losing four to seven times that on average, uh, for people. And so they start a, um, a signature collecting campaign to decertify their union. Tell us about that and what's in. I mean, we know what's behind it and that they've been basically, they feel like they haven't been, uh, they've been underrepresented by their union, but what are they trying to achieve here? The main goal of this decertify, uh, collecting signatures for a decertify um, petition is to be represented by a different union and they particularly want to be represented by the Teamsters, but in the preliminary conversations they've had with like local Teamsters reps, um, they're they're very hesitant to wade into this for over um, different reasons. The Teamsters are, are are hesitant, and and a lot of that has to do, as far as I can tell from your piece, is because there's essentially like a no poaching uh, compact between unions. Yeah, exactly. So the official like no poaching, no raid agreement between the major unions includes um, the Teamsters, the AFL-CIO, who which is like comprised of like over forty unions, SEIU, um, UFCW. Like, they're, these are some of the biggest unions in the country. But what's not exactly clear is if this no raid agreement only applies to those four unions, or if this means that they can't. Uh, they, they can't like poach or raid another union that's not represented a part of those. And that's kind of the conflict the people who are running the decertify campaign are running into. It, at, at this moment, the Teamsters don't really have an interest in taking them on, even though that's who the rural letter carriers want to be represented by. And I think it's reasonable why they'd want to be represented by the Teamsters. I mean, the Teamsters are coming off a huge summer with UPS. And, a, and Sean O'Brien at the top has been a very like militant leader coming out of like a a reform movement of its own. And do you have a sense of that? It's there's, there's a possibility that the teamsters uh, are basically like in public. We cannot in any way express a desire to um, unionize you guys. You need to first sort of like separate from your union before we can step in. Or is it that there is a genuine lack of interest? So I, I think I think the point you're getting at is really really uh, important because if it is the case that the Teamsters don't want to step in until they get the signatures, uh, that's complicated for the rural letter carriers because they don't want to read they don't want to submit these votes or submit these signatures for a future decertification vote unless they have the guarantee of a union. So it has to be a budge either from the Teamsters um, when they're when they're pretty close to reaching the around 33, 36,000 signatures that are needed, they need 30% of the membership before it can go forward. But I, the, the decertify and our LCA people I've spoken with have told me that even if they reach that number 
of signatures they need to collect, they're not going to submit this because they understand what an existential threat um, their work would face without any sort of union agreement. Yeah. So to be clear, these decertifiers, they want a union. They are not in any way anti-union. They are just feeling like we need a different union because this one's not effective. And they're out there trying to explain this to their fellow letter carriers that we will not, we are going to collect, it's almost like you're getting a strike authorization as opposed to, it doesn't mean you're going on strike. It means that you have the ability to, in the event that it's necessary, and they, uh, these decertifiers are, uh, are saying, um, and to be clear, like d if they deliver the 33,000 signatures and the last uh, number I saw is that they were maybe closer to like 10 to 15,000 uh, signatures and they need to get these by the end of the year, would it automatically decertify or is there a vote to decertify after the signatures are collected? There would be a vote to decertify after the signatures are collected. So the December deadline, um, th that's the internal deadline decertify, the decertifiers have. Technically, they can run this out till next May. And the reason it's May is when the NRLCA's next contract expires. Because if they do go forward with a decertification vote, that has to happen during the next, during the end or at the end of the current uh, contract. Did you have a sense that if they got to 33, let's say 34,000 uh, signatures, that at that point they might find a union that would commit to uh, taking them under the wing so that uh, in between, you know, the time that they had achieved a certain number of signatures and the time the election happens, they will have already at least secured at least some indication of where uh, they won't be essentially orphaned. I I think if they reach that the 30% threshold, the other unions, if it's not the team series, the other unions are going to have to like take this seriously. It's um, it's it, it it's asking a lot for a person currently represented by a union to put to express interest in decertifying their union. Like that shouldn't that threat should not be taken um, lightly and. Honestly, from the NRLCA's response, I think they understand the stakes of what reaching that 30% threshold means. Because right now, uh, the union's leadership, they're not, they're entirely focusing on um, how, and on how the how these union members would be left without a union in, in the case of decertification, which is the main point that these decertifiers are trying to clarify that we are not going to do anything unless we have the backing of another one. So, so in other I, words, union leaders right now are fighting this effort to collect signatures by, by making it seem like you're going to be without a union period. If you decertify as opposed to, uh, the introduction of the idea of like, they're actually shopping for a different union as opposed to no union. Yeah. And the people, even people who even letter carriers who are like, uh, skeptical of like putting their name on the signature. They're, one of the things I, I was hearing is that um, still like the like the union's leadership is not responding to the fact that they um, provided incorrect estimates of how uh, much hours they would lose. Like it, there's a there's an, a vice article in in my piece that I cited where they actually get a get an interview with the letter carriers union president. And he's like, he admitted there's going to be winners and losers, but it doesn't really sound like there's much remorse for how it's played out so far. Right. And we should also say that these uh, rural carriers have talked to uh, some of their compatriots who are city carriers and don't feel like it would be much of an upgrade to get the city uh, carrier union as well. Um, what, how are they collecting signatures? I mean, I mean, this has got to be hard, right? Like, it's one thing to collect in your town, but one of the challenges, particularly in, in a rural setting, is like, you're gonna have to drive, like how do you drive eight hours to get to you know the next sort of facility where all these letter carriers are sort of coming out? I mean, they're all spread out. That's the, that's the, that's the point, I guess. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a very shoestring operation. The, per the main person collecting the signatures, he's a letter carrier in, I believe, North Carolina or Tennessee. And he's like sending out these petitions to people who are who express interest. And he's the one that's kind of like um, managing, m managing the signature 
collection. Is there and some it, type of website that they've set up or anything like that? Yes, yes. They have decertifynrlca.com. And that's decertifynlcra.com. We'll put a link to that in our uh, podcast and YouTube uh, descriptions. Um, I mean, it, it, you know, I'm not sure what the point of, of, uh, or, or why you'd want to hang with a union that um, has has really allowed for these level of cutbacks, and also, frankly, I think um, the I don't know to what extent the unions have any ability to agitate against uh, uh, Louis DeJoy, but it 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 feels like the 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 route that they have chosen is just to go along to get along, and uh, it seems a little bit anachronistic in, in this era. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, Jared Facundo, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. We'll put a link to your piece and to uh, that uh, site if there are rural letter carriers listening who um, want to uh, get involved in like this attempt to uh, find another union. Really appreciate your time, Jared. All right. Thank you so much. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Dr. Sarah Nur uh, Yildiz. Professor of History at uh, Middle East Technical University in Ankara, Turkey, who is um, frankly going to spend a big part of the next um, a few minutes explaining to me um, the relationship between um, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, we'll be right back after this. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. Joining us now, Dr. Sarah Nur Yildiz. She's a professor in history at Middle East Technical University in Ankara, Turkey, uh, who has uh, obviously been uh, uh, writing and uh, uh, studying the, this um, about this conflict over Nagorno-Karabakh and, and really between, I guess, Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, which has been... Um, going on for some time right i mean will you will you just start with by um giving us a sense of like you know wh where the i guess the historical sort of like context for this um uh conflict okay well let me first start with some geography i think that may help as well um to envision uh nagorno karabakh it is a mountainous enclave, which is currently in the territorial borders of Azerbaijan. It is about the size of, of the state of Rhode Island, around 4,400 uh, squared kilometers. So we're not talking about a huge place, but um, nevertheless, uh, this region has been recently, as, as we know, um, uh, really undergoing some traumatic events. Um, and I would say, however, uh, first of all, the uh, Armenian inhabitants of Nagorno-Karabakh, or Artsakh, as it has been historically known, uh, have been there for, well, for time immemorial, we could say. Um, but 
there was never any ethnic tensions uh, of any uh, of, of any of this kind in in the earlier periods, say uh, in the early modern period, when we have uh, basically this region was under the control of Iranian Hans under you know during you know in the 16th 17th century and, and it really changes in not in 1828 with the conquest of the Caucasus by Russia and the creation of this viceroyalty um, province uh, based at Tbilisi and however uh, let, me under, you, let me just ask Russian you let, let me just ask you, it, it, so when we're talking about, you know, uh, 15th, 16th uh, century or so, um, the, yeah. uh, how delineated was Armenia and Azerbaijan and how both in terms of like, um, you know, to the, uh, in terms of borders and in terms of like um, uh, Armenians are predominantly uh, Christian um in Azerbaijan, uh, uh, predominantly Muslim, um, like what, what, like I, between, yeah. I, I'm also curious between Turkey and Azerbaijan, like where, how did, what, wh how did Armenia and uh, sort of like that Armenian, uh, nationality or ethnicity, how did that, uh, develop? Okay, well, um, in the early modern period, before the Russian conquest, um, there, there were, were Hanates that the Iranian, well, beginning the Safavid and then later the Qajar period, we have, like, under, under Iranian rule, we had these sort of semi-autonomous Hanates, who were the political rulers, they were Muslim, but um, there were there was there there seemed to be no real problem between Armenians and Azer, well Turks, Muslim Turks, Azer, Azerbaijanis, is, you know that's a later name, but um, not really until 1905 do we see any, you know, the beginning of bloodshed between these communities. So this is a purely modern phenomenon. And what we can say, though, is there was uh, Nagorno-Karabakh was a ma highly mountainous region, mostly with Armenians living in the region, but surrounded in the valleys, the lower valleys, valleys were the Muslims. So you had uh, a different topographical distribution rather than any kind of state delineation. So this is, explains why you have this mixed population. And, and in the Soviet period, um, if we skip through history, uh, we see that um, uh, in order to preserve, like, sort of the self determination of, you know, the Armenian population of Nagorno Karabakh, they made it into an autonomous oblast or or province, sub province of Azerbaijan, and the Soviets seem to be capable of keeping things under control. They're even though there had been terrible bloodbath during World War I, um, this was, you know, put under control basically in the Soviet period. And then we see it breaking out again with the collapse of the Soviet Union. And in 1988, we see that the population of Gorna Karabakh had a referendum and declared their independence. This was, I think, in the summer. And then a few months later, Azerbaijan also declared its independence. So you see this, um, this is sort of the beginning of, of the conflict that we see the roots of today. And uh, there was the first massacre, Sumgate, um, in 1988. And then we have subsequent communal conflicts, massacres, uh, both sides, uh, 1992, Khojali is, is what Azerbaijan is always talking about, is, is like an Armenian pogrom or massacre against Azeris. So it, it just sort of this, this kind of blame game keeps going on and on and continues. And unfortunately, uh, the international community has done really nothing <laughs> to prevent us from getting to where we are now. 
And uh, just so that people understand sort of geographically, um, N- Nagorno-Karabakh or, uh, Bach, uh, or um, I guess Artsakh, uh, you know, as it was referred to by, um, by Armenians, um, it, there's almost like, a, it's almost analogous to the way that like, um, uh, uh, like Berlin was in East Germany, right? Like there is like one road to uh, Nagorno-Karabakh where they would get their supplies from Armenia and uh, they were sort of cut off, uh, you know, uh, at least sort of, I don't know, psychically or uh, geographically from the rest of Azerbaijan, although that they were sort of like an island within Azerbaijan. Is that right? Yes, but the I, the real island aspect happens a bit later with the 2020 war. Now, remember that in 1990, well, I mean, in, in the 1990s, um, which was the, the war between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan, it resulted in a ceasefire in 1994 broken by Russia, and Armenians emerged as the victors in this war. And this the this war was a great... Um, sort of trauma for Azerbaijan and the ruler El uh, uh, at that time he was he, he basically lost all political legitimacy and that's when uh, Aliyev's father took over power and ruled for ten years um, based on the idea that uh, El the um, uh, previous uh, ruler was guilty of basically destroying Azerbaijan and Armenian soldiers had taken a large uh, territory amount of territory well relatively speaking um in the lower valleys making uh, contiguous to armenia and they've and part of the negotiations that have been ongoing in the last decades was the armenian occupation of this azari territory should be returned but armenians always said well we can't return it unless we're given a guarantee of security for the population of nagorno karabakh in 2020 war the 44 day war in 2020 basically was um an azerbaijani victory and they reclaimed that lower valley land and then made basically nagorno karabakh um, uh, kind of this island dependent on the Lachin Corridor, uh, which is what you were referring to. And, and, uh, and Russian peacekeepers were essentially maintaining that dynamic until um, fairly recently, and ostensibly because uh, Russia is occupied with their occupation and invasion of, of, of Ukraine, um, and they basically didn't have the resources nor the uh, interest in um, in maintaining that dynamic. And that's basically what we've seen over the past couple of weeks, I guess. Yeah, I mean, that's one explanation. Um, um, if you start looking into the local politics, things get a bit more complicated. But ultimately, the Russian peacekeepers... Uh, refused to do anything about the blockade that started December 11 of 2022. And this blockade basically last, I mean, it lasted until this war um, for nine months, starving the residents of Nagorno Karabakh. And so these people. So, Azerbaijan, just to be clear, uh, blockaded the that corridor where uh, 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 folks in Nagorno uh, Karabakh would get their supplies, their food, their exactly uh, you know, medical uh, supplies, medical, all et cetera. So and this so is this this you had one hundred and forty blocking hundred and forty thousand or so people basically cut off <laughs> from uh their you know uh th- these type of sort of like daily needs of supplies. Exactly. Yeah hundred and twenty thousand people um, they keep saying this is the the population, and now I mean, it, it, you you can see uh, you know starvation on on the faces of many of these refugees. I mean, this has been uh, you know devastating, and um, currently, well, there's probably as of this afternoon our time here, it, there was about fifty thousand people who had crossed over. And now probably a lot more, and they're still in the process of registering these people in 
uh, Armenia. And um, it, it's really, I, I mean, it is a really hu hu incredible human, you know, huge tragedy at the moment um, because these people have lost everything and they, um, you know, the, they're going to a country that doesn't have a lot of uh, resources and doesn't, doesn't have petroleum wealth. So, yeah, it, it, it's right now very, very um, what's the concerning, value, but it's what, not. What's the value uh, to Azerbaijan for Nagorno-Karabakh? Like, what is, is there a particular resource that's available there? Is that a, um, some type of like transportation hub like i don't i'm not i'm not clear on what has been the sort of urgent motivation i guess because what we're seeing is ethnic cleansing right i mean this is you 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 know you're talking about uh, about 50 percent of the population of this area within the course of uh, two weeks are leaving all of their possessions outside of what they can carry on their backs more or less um homes businesses um and you know this you know this is maybe just the start maybe a bit what is the value of nagorno karabakh to azerbaijan well i think there are several values one of course it's the political capital that it imparts onto aliyev and um, you know he 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 rules as you probably know um, with a with a iron fist a dictator he and his clan um, you know the Pashevs who his wife's family is is like the most powerful family actually in Azerbaijan they basically own the country and. Um, they have to, though, appeal. They, 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 they use nationalism to bolster, consolidate their power, obviously. And and when people do protest or political opposition has any thing, you know, in you know any any kind of um, uh, protest against anything they do, they end up in jail immediately. So. I mean, this, I have to say this, like Erdogan looks like a, a democratic ruler in comparison. And, and, and Turkey, is, it, so. is, it, is it the like the existence of any type of like ongoing defiance to an autocrat's rule becomes a threat merely because it's showing that some people can get away with it? Is that what's going on there? Or is it like... Um, I mean, it's it's complicated. I mean, to understand Aliyev's uh, power, I mean, he's a dynasty. His father was there before him for a decade. Um, and he has patrol wealth behind him. And he has uh, a good uh, PR campaign for the last, well, since 2011. They have poured a lot of that money from the petroleum um, wealth into... Uh, into bribing politicians all you know in Europe and in the United States so um, they have you know very carefully crafted um, out you know Aliyev's power and uh, he's he's very 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 firmly in power and I, I don't know of any Azerbaijan I mean very few Azeris uh, will critique him who are not abroad it, 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 it's 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 it, it's virtually impossible to be, um, at least from the outside. I'm not there, so I can't really say right. um, exactly how this works. The second thing, too, is this. Why is Nagorno-Karabakh important? Because there is also, it has a huge amount of natural resources in the form of minerals. And this is where the oligarch conflict, as I would call it, comes into. Probably, I mean, so, you know, I... Aliyev is not the only oligarch or, I mean, you know, billionaire politician uh, in, in, in the equation. And, and this is a bit complicated and maybe controversial what I'm going to say, but the um, recent state minister of Nagorno-Karabakh is a billionaire oligarch. This is Ruben well, he, uh, he, Varda course, Vardanyan. Okay. Vardanyan was just arrested today 
big news by Azerbaijan at the border when he tried to cross into Armenia. And he's also Pashinyan, Nikol Pashinyan, the current prime minister of Armenia's biggest, one of his biggest enemies. And um, and this this whole uh, equation of, of, of Vardin, Vardanian reappearing into, well, appearing into Artsakh, the Republic of Artsakh, becoming the state minister in 1221 has really, I think, been overlooked as to how it has really shooken up the situation. And they say that Vardanyan, well, he mean he's on the the, um, you know, after the uh, invasion of Ukraine by Ru by Russia, um, you know, there was the list of oligarchs who needed to be sanctioned. He was among these. So the United States, Ukraine, have designated him a sanctioned. Russian citizen, and this coincides, of course, with him trying to relinquish his Russian citizenship, which he had in 2021. He took on Armenian citizenship, and then he ends up in Karabakh, Nagorno-Karabakh, as a minister for several months. And, and, and I mean, the thing is that uh, there is an accusation that he, he, I mean, he is so wealthy, and he has been in his hands in everything. And that his, his his control of the mines, you know, is something that probably Aliyev wants to prevent. In fact, we have to go back to events in December, just right around the time the blockade began. And there was a lot of, okay, there was this incident of, our, of Azeri ecological protesters at the... Lachin Corridor, and they were protesting Vardanyan's extraction of the wealth of Karabakh. Now, there's two very, very important mines, which, Al Al which uh, Aliyev has promised, well, gave to, I mean, well, his, his father gave to, obviously, in 1997 to the Anglo-Asian mining company, which is run by a very shady character who was... A, you know, escaped Iran during the revolution, who was a, was a high official under the Shah. And his name is Reza Vaziri. And he, along with his um, cohorts in uh, Britain and the United States, including Michael Sununu, the son, and the governor of the former governor of New Hampshire, um, Sununu. I mean, these people are, are members of the board of this mining company. So here we have... We should also say former um, chief of staff for George W. Bush, I think it was, or was exactly. it... Uh, uh, yeah. Exactly. So here we have, you know, these oligarchic interests clashing over these mines. And as we know that mining companies are extremely destructive to the environment. And in fact... I mean, Aliyev, they have their own company. Like the second largest mine, mining company in Azerbaijan is owned by Aliyev and his wife. Um, and they have been, this mining company, you know, has, has been really, I mean, very corrupt. All mining companies are basically corrupt entities. And I think the Anglo, it was maybe the Anglo-Asian mine in Azerbaijan that... Uh, basically poisoned the water of these villages in a place called Suyutlu, which uh, in the summer, uh, the villages were protesting against the, um, basically the construction of another artificial lake in which they would put the gold, uh, you know, processing waste into right. this open lake, which basically is, you know, total toxic, disastrous, um, thing for the environment and for the villagers and they were brutally repressed um this summer so we we you know so here we have basically um, dispossession of people whether they're Azeris, but especially right now of the Gornokarabakh residents over these these kinds of resource wars but all done under the legalities of the current systems and i think this is this is part of the tragedy that we have to place this in it's not just about saying, you know, we have to respect the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan, which is the, the main talking point in international circles in, in, in this respect. Of course, the whole idea of self-determination is part of the Madrid conference has completely been forgotten because Azerbaijani, uh, you know, sort of public relations has, has really made 
that not part of the the, the, the talking points anymore. And um, and so so basically here we are, um, dispossession of people from from you know their home and not only that, but also a cultural genocide of Nagorno-Karabakh, which has been, I mean, there have been archeological digs that go to, you know, before Christ. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's, it, but it doesn't end here. Uh, the next step is taking Sunik or the, Zangaz, the Zangazur corridor, which is south bordering Iran, in between Nahchivan, which is like kind of, it borders Armenia and Turkey, but is not contiguous to Azerbaijan. So they need to make this contiguous to Azerbaijan by taking Sinuk or uh, the, Zang the Zangazur corridor. And this is, is, is one of the biggest pieces of, uh, um, you know, headlines in Turkey right now, because Erdogan and, and Aliyev are working towards, this is the next step. And, and Armenians naturally see that this is not just the end of the problem, but a continue. This 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 will not stop. This will continue. Wow. Um, uh, it, it really. I hope that I didn't make this. But <laughs> no, no. I mean, <laughs> I, I, it's been very helpful to understand. I mean, it basically feels like it comes down. Uh, to some type of like neo-feudal uh, war uh, amongst um, just sort of like, uh, you know, neo-dukes uh, and, and, and lords, essentially. Uh, but in this instance, it's just uh, people who are, you know, uh, oligarchs and uh, they're uh, marshalling nationalities. Yeah, but it, it's just... Yeah, I mean, we should maybe just say billionaires. Billionaires. Because it's not just happening. Uh, right. You know? Right. I mean, Post-Soviet billionaires, we call them oligarchs, somehow to mark them as more corrupt. But 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 the really just part of this whole, you know, um, sort of corrupt landscape. Right. Right. Fair enough. Uh, I have no problem with just calling them billionaires. Um, but um, it's, it's fascinating, and it sounds... Um, I guess, let me, is there a danger that we're going to move from this ethnic cleansing and this cultural genocide to actual genocide? Because it, it, it feels like the only thing that sort of like is standing in that way is the public relations sort of project that, um, the billionaire run Azerbaijan wants to maintain that they still have some type of righteousness in here. And that would be far uh, more difficult if we start to see like a, an actual genocide as opposed to the, the horrific in its own, the ethnic cleansing and the cultural genocide. It's a very good question. Um, you know, what, what I don't understand about the international community is during the nine months of the blockade that they weren't there, that they weren't doing anything. And now we see Samantha Powers shows up, you know, to the refugee camps and, you know, the, the processing centers and talks to Armenian refugees and promises 11.5, you know, billion dollars or was it million dollars? to um for the refugees and then um you know then the eu you know says oh we'll send money too of course they don't mention i mean they'll send what three three million or th yeah something like three million dollars but i mean they don't kind of uh, mention that back in you know a year before in 2022 the eu had promised around two billion euros to um you know, to, to Azerbaijan to develop and aid or whatever that is that they were promising. I mean, so when you think about the money that's being promised to the refugees and to Armenia, it's quite minuscule. Right. Um, it, it's really, um, so will there be a gen genocide if, if, if Azerbaijan decides to liquidate, liquidate Armenia, if they can? Um, this is, this is, 
big question. And I think many Armenians fear this. And um, until we have an international community that can actually do something rather than just, you know, show up when it's too late. Um, yeah, I, 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 I have no, no answer. Uh, Dr. Sarah Nur uh, Yildiz, uh, Professor of History at Middle East Technical University, Ankara, Turkey. Thank you so much uh, for your time today. Really appreciate it. We'll put a link um, uh, to uh, one of the pieces you wrote uh, with Jean uh, Bajalan, uh, among others, uh, back in uh, 2020, uh, which gives a, a good sort of like primer. Uh, you, you guys were aware that things were headed, at least in some respects, in this direction. Uh, and some other pieces so that people can read into this more. But um, really appreciate your walking us through this. It's an incredibly complex uh, conflict, which at the end of the day seems to boil down to uh, billionaires wanting resources, wanting more money. Um, but uh, really appreciate your coming on. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. You too. Um, okay, folks, we're going to take a, a break head into uh the fun half of the program reminder tonight um we will have the republican debate with the six all-star republican primary guys and of course missing from the debate tonight will be um sorely missed asa hutchinson the from wherever he's from former <laughs> governor of arkansas and sure. guy hanging out wherever he is uh no longer uh in the mix and um which and i and i wonder if the uh other republican primary candidates are are thinking about how they're going to carve up his uh one percent um which incidentally going to go to trump <laughs> it's uh, have all that things. If they do carve that up, it's going to probably double what uh, a couple of those guys actually have. I mean, the amazing thing about it is, if you look at the numbers, it doesn't even feel like if you added up all of the rest of the field that they would be really. I mean, maybe if you added up all of them, they would uh, think so. compete, but. Certainly not all the never Trumpers, right? Like Vivek is like he's went down since the first debates, at least what I saw. The early results were not good for him. People thought like he won it because he was the loudest or something, but people didn't react fondly to him. I got news for Vivek. Um he may be able to sell some books and he may be able to like um I I, I, don't, I don't, maybe he's gonna get himself a pardon if he ever needs one or something yeah. like that. Uh from somebody, but um, Vivek does not have a huge electoral future in the Republican Party. But I also think that that is, when you have that kind of money, that's not what's going on there. He's uh, just grifting. Yep. Well, I think what he's doing is setting up a dynamic so that in his future business endeavors, he's going to have the relationships with um, uh, politicians that are going to sort of uh, grease those, uh, uh, you know, wheels. Um, I guess this is why I'm not in Vivek's place, but if I like pump and dump my way to that kind of wealth, I would be on a beach somewhere. I wouldn't be lying in front of cameras. 100%. 100%. Uh, I will say this, like, you know, like, you know, th there's uh, been a recent controversy cause there's been a, it was a billionaire who was funding a bunch of shows some which apparently um but was you know, a friend was he just friends was it just yeah billionaire you know friend friendly billionaire <laughs> and um a lot of people make issue of like uh of uh, jimmy Dore saying that you know i can be bought and this and that and they're like he admitted it and I, I imagine when he said that he it was a joke um but i mean but sometimes there's something called uh, joking on the square mm. but nevertheless i will put this out there if there's a billionaire out there who wants to fund uh, me with $10 million, I'll tell you what I will do. I will go down to uh, one day a week. I'll, I'll do an interview, you guys, and I'll spend the rest of the time on the beach. I'll, I mean, I'll just put it out there. 
I mean, I think some people in this industry have been doing, you know, guest hosts for extended periods of time to the point that the uh, chat is starting to kind of wonder where the normal guy is. Wait, what? On Jimmy Dore's. Uh, oh, is that right? Yeah, there's some guy that's been filling in for Jimmy for a while. I'm not sure why. why? I mean, Jimmy needs a vacation or something. Yeah. I'll take it. Uh, yeah, where's my billionaire? Yeah. How much would it take uh, to get one of you guys on the beach? Uh, like uh, full time. I mean, 5K a month might not be it, but it'd be it go a good. Well, listen, towards. the 5K a month is just a number that is a speculation. Nobody's seen the books, right. and it's a, it sounds like a minimum of 5K a month. Uh, introductory, yeah. But yeah, even yeah. that would be like, you know, I'm, I'm looking. Yeah, I don't need yeah. a lot. I'd, 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 uh, I'd do it for my, I'd do it for. I'll do it for less than Jimmy. I'll yeah, tell you that. for sure. For sure. <laughs> to, go, to, to go to the beach. Just, yeah. I don't even like the beach that much. Jimmy Buffett mode. I mean, I prefer lakes. If if Mike, I'll tell you that right now. If my kid was twenty two, my youngest was twenty two, that number would drop precipitously. We'll make that clear. If I was friends with a billionaire, I mean, I know you can't ask him now because he's passed, but I would ask him things like, "Hey, what do you think about Chicago Teachers Union?" Just pick his brain about things like that. Libertarian. Um. Uh, folks, it's your support that makes this show possible. And if you're a billionaire, it's your support that can make the show not possible. Get re super independent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. For, uh, you know, for literally, um, uh, pennies a day. Is it pennies a day? How many shows do we do a month? Let's say 20, right? Uh, 50 cents a day. It's actually probably more than 20, but let's just call it 50, 48 cents a day. Um, this show will be here uh, providing you uh, guests that you may not hear anywhere else, really, in many respects. Um, and for, I don't know what, uh, um, how $10 million uh, breaks down per show, but for $10 million, you can find out. You could, you could, <laughs> it could be a lot less of me. <laughs> you can send me to the beach. But uh, for the rest of you, uh, join the majority report.com. If it's $10 million, we, you got to call me because I don't want to uh, run it through uh, the, fee, the, the fees on that are going to be too much. Yeah. Uh, up a direct deposit. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Call on 646-257-3920. We'll go to the private, uh, private uh, phone thing. Um, but honestly, uh, if you do listen to the show on a regular basis and you enjoy our content, uh, support us. Uh, when you become a member, you not only get the free show free of uh, commercials, you get access to the fun half if you want it. You don't have to listen to it. You can also I am the show. And you can help the show survive and thrive. Join the majority report.com. Also, check out our Discord, majority discord.com. I think we like close to 9,000 people in there. Um, if you're on YouTube, like us. Tell your friends, if you're on Twitch, we got a massive hype train yesterday. I think, like a, I think we were pushing like a hype train 12. I'm pretty sure we got above that, actually. But, Did we? And we, we have a, we're close to a hype train now. Apparently, it is, uh, it's a good month to be subscribing to Twitch because there's a 25% off thing uh, as well. Whoa. So I think that's where some of that energy came from yesterday. Damn. Yeah. Um Pac-Man hit 2 million subscribers? Did he? I did not congratulate him. Do you know we have more than Timcast? Subscribers? Yeah. Is that right? He's got 1.2. I didn't know that. Uh, oh, also, don't forget JustCoffee.coop. Fair trade coffee to your chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY. Get 10% off. Join us tonight at 9 p.m. If you're not joining us in the fun half today. Uh... Bradley, ESVN, what did you guys talk about? We um, did a pretty a comprehensive wrap-up of week three of NFL action and what we uh, and did our predictions for Monday Night Football. And then tomorrow we will have ESVN OT to give our three top picks for the weekend. Um, YouTube.com slash ESVN show to catch up on the broadcast or to check out some clips before we go live tomorrow again at 4 p.m. Matt. Left Reckoning. Yeah, Left Reckoning last night. We had Jacob from the Valley Labor Report, uh, an outfit that's been getting a lot of love from the UAW Twitter feed, a lot of retweets. I'm um, talking about the UAW strategy, some of the um, 
uh, dumb, dumb critiques of the strategy, um, a bit, bit premature, um, maybe planting seeds to say, I told you so in case it doesn't go well, but, uh, talked about that and, uh, oh, also went deep into this Tim pool grocery store communism, uh, story. Oh, we're going to talk about that today. About, we'll talk about the, the fun half, but in the post game, we, uh, we talked about that for about an hour. So, uh, patreon.com says left reckoning. You enjoy my socialism. I am says uh, more subscribers than Tim Cast yet. No MR skate park. Very sus indeed. Uh, Star Fox says, "Can the server uh, please get a shofar?" Or and I'm losing it, bro. For our member Sea Dog, they start grad school at the University of Washington today, and they're going to knock them dead. Go Sea Dog. Go Huskies. Hi, Bumbler. <laughs> Ooh, uh, MSNBC Cedar says, uh, careful with the defamation slander against Dim Tool, Matt. I'm showing his YouTube subscriber count at 1.57 million. Uh, which uh, channel is that? Because I think he might have, maybe he has more than one. That's what it is. He's got many. Yeah. All right, folks. Um, oh, and uh, Samantha Ears says, uh, Pac-Man hasn't hit 2 million. We got to stop listening to the IMs. It's complete <laughs> disinfo. Still at 1.9. All right, folks. Hey, subscribe to this channel, and we'll see you in the fun half. Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> Good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight, fifty-six, twenty-seven, one half, five, eights, three point nine billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd. Don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left-wing Limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Rand Paul. I had my first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. <laughs> what you're talking about is jibber jabber. Classic. I'm feeling more.